I, uh, uh, oh, look at this. This is a picture. <laughs> I don't know how that got there. Uh, uh, my son is an F-18 pilot for the Navy. He went to the dark side to my great shame. Uh, but he is a, he's now he's a Top Gun instructor in uh, Fallon, Nevada. He's assigned there for the next couple of years. He's pretty good at it. I had to get that in. That's the only thing I really worth bragging about. Um, I want to give you a quick bio, if I can. Uh, not so much about me, but I want to tell you just really quickly about the book. Uh, and then that's all, that's all we'll talk about the book. Because uh, I think that's... During the Civil War, the Union Army had created entire regiments of invalid soldiers to serve on active duty in a rear guard capacity. These soldiers had already sacrificed great, greatly, including amputations. But they still wanted to serve. They had altruistic reasons. My sacrifice was for a greater cause. They had practical ones, too. They needed to eat. So I tracked the actual movements of one of these such regiments, the 18th, from its inception in Washington, D.C., down the, down the Potomac by boat uh, to uh, Belle Plain, Virginia, which no longer exists, and culminating in a two-day, 25-mile force march where they averaged less than one mile an hour. Now they served with honor and distinction to a man. They were all volunteers. By 1864, a good chunk of the Union Army were conscripts and draftees. These people could leave any time they wanted to. They chose to stay. Now, I read about that in a book written by Bruce Catton, and I'll get to that in a second, A Stillness at Appomattox. He devotes three pages to it. This is probably the iconic narrative nonfiction of the Civil War, Stillness at Appomattox. And if you were a history major in college or even in high school, you may have been required to read it. I was. I never did. I was not a good student. All right, so I read it when I was 55 years old. All right, and that sang to me. It was a story that had to be told. So uh, I, I can't get a better bio than what I got from Lloyd, but this is basically uh, my uh, two cents worth. This so is we're, the, gonna, we're gonna talk about three things. We're gonna talk about some of the history of the Civil War and how the Veterans Reserve Corps, which most of you, did any of you know about this before I just told it, is I'm gonna deal a little bit with PTSD, only because um, I, as I'm launching into the second half of my life, if you will, I'm learning a great deal and, and I'm meeting some wonderful people. And at the very end of it, I want to talk about some of the charities I support and some cautionary notes about charities in general, how people deal with it and cope with it. PTSD, by the way, is not just about soldiers. It could be about anybody, from personal witness or experience or as a first responder. For the record, EMTs and policemen and firemen are by far the highest majority of people that have problems with PTSD, not veterans or not soldiers who have been in combat. The chief difference between people who develop PTSD and those who don't, two people who experience the exact same thing, is basically how they cope with the trauma, how they master it, how they manage it, and how they minimize stress. The reality is with pe people with PTSD, the individual suffers from it, they're dealing with two huge things. What is happening to him or her now, and how will he or she be perceived? There are two very distinct elements. What is happening, and how are they going to be perceived? The paranoia element of it. Okay? Does the memory of the incident produce a significant impairment? And that is the trigger for future therapy. Okay, so what are we supposed to do? Uh, as individuals, whether we know someone has it or we're trying to be sympathetic, we want to enhance the self-esteem. We need a partnership in it together with the people that who are suffering from it. Close relationships are hugely important. The family healing process, um, avoidance of our, uh, narcotics and alcohol, like that's like a no-brainer. Anybody who's got any kind of problems should be avoiding that stuff. Um, all right, the first one is Hope for the Warriors. Hope for the Warriors was started by a couple of Army housewives. They're now headquartered in New York and in Virginia. They give 95% plus. Uh, they host events. They give direct aid to veterans and veteran families to help them throw. Uh, they don't have a requirement that they have to be wounded, but invariably, that's part of the problem, okay? But this is number one on Charity Navigator website, number one, okay. which doesn't list wounded warriors very high, by the way. All right, uh, the American Legion, Operation Comfort Warriors. Everybody knows the American Legion, baseball, bars, most, you know, mostly guys that walk around with funny hats. Um, uh, they have a huge arm of different charities, and Operation Comfort Warriors is one of them. It's specifically for wounded veterans and their families, and it gives household items to them. 100% of the money that is in Operation Comfort Warriors uh, is donated directly to clients and client services. Again, a very worthy cause. These are all 501c3s in case you want to take a note on it and donor designate going into the future. 
The next one is Phoenix Patriot Foundation. Uh, I had the pleasure of, by accident, meeting the CEO of this, a former Navy SEAL. Uh, and for the record, I'm going to say this, uh, and v is going to torture me about it, but a Navy SEAL could eat three Marines. <laughs> All right, that's just the way it is. Jared Ogden is one of the nicest guys in the world. He's a ring knocker from Annapolis, spent eight years in. He started the Phoenix Patriot Foundation when his commanding officer lost, lost both his legs with an IED uh, accident in Afghanistan. That commanding officer, uh, Dan Knossen, C-N-O-S-S-E-N, -S -S uh, is also a Paralympic athlete who now, uh, he went to Sochi, placed eighth in the downhill skiing uh, event at, at Sochi. So he's, he's not some couch potato. He is, uh, the reason uh, he's the inspiration for it is because what Phoenix does is they don't find people jobs, they don't give them money to uh, get to, you know, pay the light bill or anything like that. Is they find high intensity events to engage uh, amputees, double and triple included, in these high intensity activities. If we think back to when we were all young and we had hair and we were a lot thinner, one of the reasons we joined the military was because we thought we could do it. We thought we could do anything. We were immortal at the time. We, could, we, we had no restrictions. The people, the youngsters that went and served and were brutally injured in the recent events in, at, at Iraq and Afghanistan, by whatever method, still have that core inside of them thinking that they could do anything. What Phoenix does is it matches these people who have had horrific injuries, and it matches them to a, basically a thrilling physical experience. Um, I'll give you an example. 18 months ago, they took six double and triple amputees on jet skis from Jacksonville to New York City using the uh, intercoastal waterway and the Atlantic Ocean. All right? I don't know about you, but that would kick my butt no matter what was going on. Uh, and it, it took a couple weeks to get it done, but they got it done. All right? And that's one of the things that Phoenix does. They're also sponsoring, they're looking for more people right now, and they might have to punt it into next year, but uh, they're also sponsoring a climb of Mount Kilimanjaro. I'm not a mountain climber. I like watching movies about mountains. I think that's really nice. And I look out the window of a plane. But I'm not going to attempt something like that. Um, but they only had two sign-ups, and they're looking for a couple more because the support network behind it, as you know, is we're logistics people. Uh, the more people you have, the, the, better, the better it's going to wind up being, the more cost-effective it's going to be. But this, it's, it's a great organization. It's local. Um, and uh, UPS sponsored them, thank you, Denise, at uh, their first fundraiser earlier in the year. Gary Sinise Foundation. Everybody knows who Gary Sinise is, the actor. Um, uh, I accidentally met him on a college campus about four years ago. I had no other affinity to him. It's like, hi, I admire your work. How are you doing? He goes, thanks, great, have a nice day. Okay, so that's my <laughs> Gary Sinise moment. Um, but he is, if there's anybody that uh, uh, gives as much of himself and his resources, he's probably uh, the Bob Hope of our time, if you will, with what he does with veterans and uh, and the cause. 100% of his foundation money goes to clients and client services. He has four uh, paid permanent staffers as part of the foundation, and uh, he pays them out of pocket. He's not such a good guitar player, but he is a great guy. <laughs> All right. The next one is Tunnels to Towers. Tunnels to Towers is an adjunct to the Stephen Siller Foundation. Uh, Stephen Siller was one of the firemen on 9-11 who lost his life. There were 350 uh, firemen and policemen that uh, died that day. The brother of Stephen Siller started a foundation in his brother's name. They have an adjunct called Tunnels to Towers. This adjunct in particular uh, retrofits homes for wheelchair-bound veterans. They wipe doorways, they create ramps, they lower countertops, all the things that we take for granted that we know has to go into assisting. Uh, and that's what Tunnels to Towers does. Uh, Dan Delian, he's a UPS uh, preload manager uh, in Manhattan. He is one of the people who's very intimate with this group, and he's a great guy. His wife is actually on the board, and she does most of the work. Dan does most of the glad handing, but um, it is a great, great uh, organization. Uh, Resources Exchange Association. I have to mention this. Uh, I was I was privileged. The uh, uh, the American Legion invited me to have a table at their convention in Charlotte this past year, uh, and I had never been to anything like that. I'm not a member. Uh, well, I am a member of the Legion, uh, but. I don't go to any of their meetings. <laughs> it's one of those things I send a check once a year. So they invited me to put up a table, and I would give a, I gave a large portion of proceeds 
uh, from sales at the convention uh, directly to Operation Comfort Warrior at the time. Uh, the, I, a lot of people came up, and it's, it's interesting, the veterans um, have very strong opinions about things, and they're not shy about giving those opinions. And those opinions and the busting chops that was going on at the American, it's like a full contact sport. So I would have people coming up and they had their hats on, and it's the morning, so they couldn't have been drinking that much, okay? They're coming up and they're challenging me about, well, what are you talking about, these charities and all this stuff? The Wounded Warriors is a terrible organization. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, they are not popular with American Legion. And they're throwing around numbers of 5 and 10% only going to it. They just, they have more stories, negative stories about Wounded Warriors than anything. But one of them came up to me, and he was particularly combative, and he wasn't listening to anything. So, you know, I'm trying to calm him down. Basically, I'm trying to sell books. My wife is flirting with people. I have no idea what's going on over there. So I'm, I'm trying to calm this guy down. And I say, well, what's, what's your thing, man? What's your story? And he was about 108 years old. And he said, this is what we do. We go to Home Depot and we ask him for 10 hammers. We go to Lowe's and we ask him for saws. We ask him for tapes. We ask him for boxes and toolkits. We put together toolkits from donated goods and we give them to vets that are just getting out of the service. And because they usually contact the local uh, VFW, they contact the local American Legion, they contact whatever association is local and say, I'm looking for work. If they're a laborer and they're not going to college, we put together a toolkit for them, give them a toolkit. I'm not a hands-on type of guy. The, the, the kind of instruments I wear, I can work a telephone. But um, to those people who don't go to college, and college isn't for everybody, having a toolkit that's fully tricked out and outfitted is huge. It's a, it's a great it's a great charity. So I give them money too. I am really a soft touch. Uh, New Horizons for Heroes. I just met this guy online through LinkedIn. Colonel Michael Pierce owns a, a huge piece of property in Augusta, Georgia, uh, very close to Fort Gordon, which is an army hospital, and where one of these warrior transition units are. And what he's doing is he's building cabins there that give people a place to stay with their families. Um, uh, kind of like that organization that's in Texas whose name escapes me, I apologize, but uh, allows people uh, an idyllic environment to relax before they're going out into the world. And, and Colonel Pierce, he's currently, he's retired, he's currently in Germany, uh, and he's, he's starting to get this thing done. So I've done my homework. All of these organizations give 85% plus to clients, client services. I've vetted them. Don't take my word for it. Uh, check out my website. And on the website has each one of these organizations. Just click into it. Check it out yourself. Okay. Um, and last, I give half my uh, royalties for the book uh, to these charities in particular. So, and that's it. That's my uh, website. And I think the last thing, if I'm ahead, thank you. There, it came up. <laughs> thank you.